Oh, hey. Hey. Con- Ca- calling Chris <laughs> calling Chris Anderson <laughs> in London. This is Chris Anderson in London calling Rick Beyer in Chicago. Hey, I I'm, I'm here, Chris, although actually neither of us is here because this is an encore episode. But we could be here. We could, we could actually be. be in this room, but, you know, hiding. Yes. <laughs> Which we do I a would lot. be. Yeah, but, yeah I know. <laughs> we want to welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help and assistance of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. And Chris and I travel the globe, but we still manage to be here most every Sunday to have a cocktail and talk about history. And don't forget our lovely Patreon subscribers. No, or... I don't want to forget them. In yeah. fact, I want to mention them and throw up our top shelf patrons. Go. And we appreciate everybody who supports us via Patreon. And uh, you can do so uh, by going to patreon.com slash history happy, happy hour. hour. Hour, hour, hour. Yeah, so that's the story with Patreon. Um, and uh, listen, if you're a first time viewer, please, uh, or any viewer, uh, if you're watching on please Facebook. Please come back. Yes, please come back. <laughs> like us on Facebook. Uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. Come back. Watch the t- watch the tapes of the old shows. They're awesome. Uh, have a great time with History Happy Hour. Yes. Chris, as we mentioned on the program last week, Congress has sent to the president a bill to award a Congressional Gold Medal to... This is a test. Uh, a hockey player. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, but also to the Ghost <laughs> Army. Oh, right, yes. Oh, sorry. that one, right. So we thought this would be a great time to bring back the Ghost Army program we did way back. We ep- thought it would be a great time? In episode. Well, you thought. It was actually your uh, suggestion. It was actually my idea. Yeah. Sorry. Episode 29, uh, when we were much younger, full of life and vigor, and so different than the empty husks we are now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have we killed enough time to pretty much drive all the viewers away? Yes, I think so. All right, well, give me a cue then. And the bar is open. What are you drinking? I'm drinking beer, uh, an anti-hero great. IPA, uh, uh, in my uh, okay. PSYOPs glass, oh, okay. in honor of our topic today, which I'm sure that you will introduce, but I, I just want to mention that we, we do have a suspension of, of one normal history happy <laughs> hour <laughs> rule <laughs> today, which is that you'd, we're going to take one drink at the beginning and not one every time we mention the subject that of unit. today's show. Yeah, the Scottish play. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, everybody, I have to do the formal introduction for those of you who haven't had a chance uh, to virtually meet Rick before. Rick is the author of the book. I'm going to do some reading here. Uh, The Ghost Army of World War II, How One Top Secret Unit Deceived the Enemy with Inflatable Tanks, Sound Effects, and Other Audacious Fakery. Tom Brokaw, who's a guy, I don't know, did he write anything? Is he important? I think he is. This guy named Tom Brokaw that we met on the street, said that the Ghost Army of World War II describes a perfect example of a little-known, highly imaginative, and daring maneuver that helped open the way for the final drive to Germany. It is a riveting tale told through personal accounts and sketches along the way. Ultimately, a story of success against great odds. I enjoyed it tremendously. Wow. That's that's pretty awesome. And oh, by the time, by the way, there's like a little local paper called the New York Times, and I guess it showed up, you know. They have some somewhere. lists. Yeah, some know. lists. Got, a, okay. got on a list, yeah. All right, so moving on. So anyway, why don't we start by having you tell people, the, the, the one or two who have not heard the story before, um, what exactly is the ghost army? Well, thanks, Chris. And I'm really happy to have a chance to, to talk about this here and not have to drink every time I mention ghost army. But... Um, when I talk about the Ghost Army, I'm referring to, uh, specifically to an American uh, deception unit that fought in World War II, the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops. And the phrase, the Ghost Army, is sometimes used to describe other things, including the Operation Fortitude D-Day deception. But in this case, this is a unit that was a multimedia deception unit that went into action starting about a week after D-Day, was their first, uh, the first folks in action doing deception. 
and carrying out deceptions against the Germans uh, basically 22 times in uh, Northern Europe. Uh, and when I say that they're multimedia, what I mean is that they are uh, doing deception through all different means. So for example, uh, they have visual deception that involves uh, inflatable tanks and trucks and artillery and anything that uh, German observers might see. They have sonic deception that involves like playing sound effects at night of trucks and tanks moving in. They have radio deception where they're playing uh, all sorts of um, uh, radio games and doing fake radio messaging. And they have a fourth kind, we will talk about it a little later, fourth kind called special effects. And the purpose of all this deception, I mean, why do you bother to have deception on the battlefield, is to basically uh, throw the Germans off balance, to um, uh, disrupt their intelligence, to convince them that American troops are here when they're really here, or to convince them that there are American troops in a spot where there are no American troops. So it's a, it's a force multiplier. It's a chance to um, put yourself at the greatest possible advantage on the battlefield. And what's cool about this unit is it's mobile, can move around, it's multimedia, as we mentioned, um, uh, and it can, it can do um, deceptions over and over. And these are what are called tactical deceptions. They're sort of relatively small scale battlefield deceptions, not sort of a big, huge theater-wide uh, strategic deception. Well, so thanks for you know stealing all my future questions there, Rick. But <laughs> you can still ask them because okay, I can good. go into detail yeah. about any of those things. <laughs> no, but um, I could also just keep talking if you wanted to just you know <laughs> relax and have a drink, Chris. Uh, no, um, so let's start kind of backing up a bit. Obviously, it's a little known unit, or it was anyway, until you did your book and your documentary. How did you stumble upon the story? I mean, what's it, what made you go, wow, this is... Yeah, so um, I met, uh, I was introduced uh, to a woman named Martha Gavin um, back in 2005 by my friend Mark Tomizawa. And Martha's uncle was in this unit. His name is John Jarvey, and he was in the 603rd Camouflage Engineers, the visual deception part of the unit. And her, it's interesting, her son had just kind of discovered this, Martha's son, and he had done a report on the Ghost Army for school, and he was really excited about it, and she was excited about it, and she said, somebody ought to do a documentary film on this. And so my friend Mark said, well, I can introduce you to my friend Rick. And so I met Martha, and we met... Um, in March 2005 at a Starbucks in Lexington, Mass, where I lived. And she had, a, she had an arm load of three ring binders and they were her uncle's wartime stuff. Everything, yeah. Saved. Everything, you know, photos. He was an artist, so there were artworks of different kinds. There were um, documents and everything. And, and I got really drawn into it. So we, I decided to try to make a film about it. Um, went to the, they had the last reunion that they had. I don't think anybody knew it was going to be the last, but they right. had a reunion. So I got to go to the reunion, meet a bunch of guys there, start interviewing guys, and that's kind of how it got started. And and, and it's never stopped, okay? I was about to say. You know, I mean, we joke about it, but I always say, I don't know if the ghost army, if I'm holding on to the ghost army or the ghost army's holding on to me. Right. Um, and I'm still meeting veterans. I talked a few weeks ago to a veteran I'd never spoken to before. I'm still learning things. I'm still excited about it. Um, I can tell. You know, uh, 15, 15 years in. Well, I, I want to get back to, I'll get back to that later, but I, I want to. Um, so you're, you're in charge, man. You're in charge. Really? I know. It's okay. a, it's a rare. <laughs> um. So anyway, so obviously you've you've kind of stumbled into this unit. You quickly discovered that it was sort of a secret operation. Um, you decided to make a film about it. It's not as if there are big files of here's all the top secret information about the Ghost Army. Um, tell us a little bit about how you went about researching it, and um, were there any ch particular challenges to researching the unit because of 
what it was, the nature of the unit? Yeah, so the first thing to, it's important to know is that I actually, um, well, I'd like to say I was the first who stumbled across this, that some other people had stumbled across it before me. Uh, and so there were a, a couple of books that had been done by that time, and particularly a, a, a really uh, comprehensive book by our mutual friend John Gaughan yep. uh, called Ghosts of the ETO. So, so that was a good starting point. And, and in John's really excellent footnotes, they pointed me towards the National Archives that there are, in fact, about four boxes. The shelf width, I have to change the our picture here to do this, but the shelf width is about this wide of boxes, and that's the entire paperwork for this that's unit. Not, and that's not a fishing story, right? In World War II, no, no. Okay. And I mean, another you might get another regimental unit, and it's the, it's right, 10 right. boxes like that, but this is four, four skinny boxes of paperwork that included a, a, a fantastic document that is now on the... Uh, Ghost Army Legacy Project website, ghostarmy.org, which is the official history of this unit. And that's kind of, um, it's kind of the base text for anybody who's writing about this, is the official history. And it's a very funny official history, which is really unusual for U.S. Army units. Official histories are usually written in very dry prose. And this is written in kind of a delightful style. And it was written by a man named Fred Fox, who uh, was an officer in the unit, later became a minister, later worked for Dwight D. Eisenhower, he of sainted memory. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and so, and he had a delightful sense of humor. So he wrote it uh, in a kind of almost not quite tongue in cheek. It's a serious document, but it has its moments of being tongue in cheek. So that's where I started. Uh, the other thing we did is that every veteran that we spoke to or every veteran family member that we spoke to we said well who else are you in touch with and spread that out through other family members and tried to and other veterans and tried to build a group of veterans that we were in touch with and asked the veterans what materials they had and and Chris, I know you'll uh, appreciate this because I know you've done very uh, similar things, but the willingness of folks yeah. to send stuff was unbelievable. And I think really, I think about Bernie Mason, who just passed away uh, at age uh, 99, I think. And Bernie um, was a lieutenant in the 603rd. And I, and I spoke to Bernie. He's like, oh, I'll send you my scrapbook. And he put his scrapbook in a priority mail box and just put it in the mail to me, his World right. War II scrapbook. And he didn't know me. He'd never met me. Right. But uh, the willingness to share the information was great. And, you know, and then you just keep poking around. You'd keep uh, the Ralph Ingersoll, who we may talk about later, who's, who's, who's part of forming this unit, you know, discovered that his papers were at Boston University, and I lived in Boston. Woohoo! Yeah. So made Convenient. a trip there and and found amazing stuff that nobody else had had ever written about in the other Ghost Army books. So yeah. that's kind of where it got started and how we moved forward. And since then, I've also you know I've tried to visit the battlefields. I've tried to expand the search. We are still researching and still learning about the veterans in the unit. So now, for for folks who don't know, I mean this is this amazing combination of um you know ordinary joes off the street and some incredibly gifted and talented artists creators people um how does the unit come together so you know on my trips i get asked a lot of times well how did how did don malarkey find easy company or how did they become paratroopers well that was easy because every magazine newsreel everything said join the paratroopers get, get right? more money tuck your right. pants into your boots yeah. <laughs> but obviously the ghost army it's a secret thing so um how in the in the rush to create this million man army do they find people with the skills and how do people with the skills find the unit it's a complicated story um and uh so we'll, i'll try to address it address some parts of it and, and, and see if that kind of can cover it for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll kind of do it a little bit backwards. The okay. unit is created, 
the Ghost Army, with the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops. Is there a more fabulous name for a secret unit? That can't, they can't the 23rd Headquarters Special <laughs> Troops can't be doing anything interesting <laughs> with a name like that. Oh, Rick, and actually, sorry, let me interrupt, sorry. But as you're answering this too, also, uh, James just asked how many people were in the unit. Oh, yes, yeah, so, so it's 1,100 it? soldiers in the unit, um, approximately. Sorry. And, um, nope, that's all good. And so, um, uh, in January 1940, in December, I'm sorry, December 1944, the orders um, are cut that call for the formation of this unit. Now it's six, five months before D-Day. Um, and so they have to go really fast. So they're not going to start drafting people and training people from scratch. So they create, they take pre-existing units that are already doing something in training and sort of throw them together into this deception unit. Mm -hmm. So the biggest one is the 603rd Camouflage Engineers. And these are the guys, many of them are artists, and I'll talk a little bit about how they formed, but they've been around for almost two years at this point, one and a half, two years. And so they're not going to be doing camouflage anymore, they're going to be doing deception. There's a signal company that's out in California that is, uh, brought in uh, that we're just going to take this signal company and that's we're going to do that. The Sonic Deception Company was kind of a different idea, the 3132nd that did Sonic Deception. They are training separately at, at Pine Camp in, um, in New York and they have in the Sonic Deception Company, they have a lot of the program, a lot of the folks from the Army Specialized Training Program, the ASTP, yep. uh, that shut down and had all these smart people in it so they grabbed as many as they could for the Sonic Deception Program. So they put all these pre-existing units together. Now, the one that has, all of them have really interesting people in them yep. and in many cases talented and skilled people. But the one that people really think about a lot I think is the uh, camouflage unit mm -hmm. that has the artists in it. And at the beginning of the war there is actually some advertising going on saying if you're an artist you know you may and some word of mouth stuff going on you may want to try to find your way into a camouflage unit. Mm -hmm. Some colleges offer Art schools offer camouflage classes. Yeah, so in Pratt 19, does, right? yeah, Pratt does. I think Cooper Union did. I think some others did. And so they are, um, they are sort of doing some training even before, even before the war starts, even before Pearl Harbor. I mean, that starts really in 1941, I think. And so there's a pipeline from some of the art schools into the camouflage unit. And so that's how a lot of the artists end up there. Um, in some cases, it's simply a case of in the in the radio unit they they decided that what they really needed were high speed radio operators. So they transferred a bunch of guys out of this signal company whose job would have been laying cable and doing stuff like that that they didn't need. And then they brought in people with a an MOS, uh, um, you know, an army uh, speciality of being a high speed radio operator like a 766 was the code that's the MOS for an army high speed radio operator what? Oh, so sorry. so there so i mean it's a combination you have some sort of advertising if you will or recruitment for the camouflage unit uh, you have some cases where officers are simply out there how can we find smart guys who can kind of figure this stuff and, and put it in? And there's probably just some that's that's pretty much uh, dumb luck. I love Jack uh, McGlynn, who was from Medford, Massachusetts, said, uh, you know, he was uh, uh, he was offered a chance to stay in a stateside unit or go with this um, this weird uh psychological operations a sound unit he didn't really know what it was going to be right. and then he was he was at a, a church or something and a a woman who was the mother of a friend of his came up to him and, and her son had been killed and she said how can you be here when he, my son was killed over there and jack said i decided i was going to get in the unit that was going to go overseas because right. i didn't want to deal with that sort of thing yeah. So it's a whole bunch of different stories. Well, you know, it's always kind of amazed me with this unit um, and also a lot of these specialized units. Um, people would always criticize the Army and joke about why the guys got selected to do certain things. But the fact that as the Army's going from nothing to eventually 16 million people in uniform, how they're actually organized enough to, to find some of these people, right? It's pretty them. amazing. And, you know, I mean, there is some... 
there's a lot of jokes about the army and in its ability to handle things like this and and Bernie Mason, who I mentioned before, when he was in basic training, he remembered the sergeant said, is there anybody in this you know, company who is an artist? And uh, Bernie raised his hand, and um, he was assigned to paint the garbage cans for the next five <laughs> yeah. days. And he said, I never raised my hand in the Army ever again. Right. Um, but on the other hand, there really is, I think, a remarkable... You know, some, I don't know exactly how they did it, but they, they do manage to kind of root the right people to the right units in so many of these different cases. And it, it, it's really quite extraordinary. You know, moving back, and I should, I should have asked you this earlier. You um, should have, whatever it is. I, whatever I don't know why is. you didn't. I'm always, sorry, everybody. Rick will take over again next week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but uh, Rich Randall asks, and I won't, I won't put the question on because it's a pretty simple one, but um, who, whose bright idea is this, right? I mean... Just right at the very basic level, whose whose idea is it, and how do they convince the army? You you got to have this. And Rich thinks that's a simple question because well, I, uh, sadly, <laughs> it's just a short one. <laughs> so it's a really great question, Rich. Thank you very much. And it's it's as far as I can tell, it's two guys, two officers, two American officers, Colonel Billy Harris and um, uh, Major Ralph Ingersoll. And I want to say, first of all, that, you know, obviously the deception has got a long military history going back to the Trojan horse. But specifically in World War II, the British had done a lot of deception. And in the case of tactical deception, they had done something called Operation Bertram in northern Africa at the Battle of El Alamein. And, and that is probably, uh, Ralph Ingersoll was in Africa. I think it's clear that, that that was in some ways the inspiration for creating this unit. But you've, you've got these two officers, and they're in London, and it's um, fall, summer, fall, 1943. And um, they're really kind of a marriage of opposites. So Ralph Ingersoll is a very flamboyant uh, civilian who's now become an Army officer. He was a publisher. He was an author. He was a journalist. He was very famous. Uh, the New York Times uh, uh, called him... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, an egotist. Uh, they had a great line about what a, what a huge egotist he was. Um, and, um, and so he's kind of this like f wacky figure. And then you've got Billy Harris, and he's this super buttoned down West Point military guy from a military family. He eventually commands the 7th Cavalry in Korea and later becomes a general. And these two guys are working together. And I think <clears throat> under normal circumstances, there are people who might not have gotten along at all, but um, they together kind of come up with this idea of, well, you know, we're, we're looking for ways that after the invasion, we can give ourselves the maximum advantage. Can we take advantage of this deception idea and can we kind of do it one better? And the one better is not only to, to sort of have the ability to do deception, but have a unit that's tasked to do it and that uh, is ready to go whenever you want it to go. And they are the ones who sell it up to um, uh, a general who's in command before Eisenhower in London, uh, Jake Devers. Yep. And Jake Devers is the guy who pulls the trigger on it. So I like to credit Harris and Ingersoll. My friend John Gaughan likes to credit Jake Devers because he's the general in charge of it. And I think it's a pretty interesting commentary you know, we don't always think of the army as being open to creative thinking. I don't think that's people's view. But in this situation with a lot of lives on the line and and the and the and the fact that if it had gone wrong for people could have pointed a finger and said, you know, you stupid idiot. What were you thinking? And you're crazy having done this very high level people, including uh, Davers, including ultimately Marshall and Eisenhower gave the okay to this, gave it priority so that it would be ready to go into action. And I think that speaks a lot of the command of the U.S. Army in Europe during World War II. Yeah. Oh, now, I had the, all these great questions in sort of a chronological order, which... Oh, it's very hard I, to deal with this story in a chronological order. I'm now going to throw them all out the window because we've Boom. been getting some great questions from folks, and I want to post them. Please. Um, so this one here... This is our training session for Chris to do the posting of questions. Like, so, well yeah, done, I blow Chris. It up. Look at that! Hey, hey. Woohoo! All right. 
So should I read it to you? You, you should because okay. I, I can't read that. Oh, okay. I mean, I even, can when I have to, but... <laughs> this is from Phil. Uh, even though deception has long been part of the military art, were there field commanders who didn't believe in it? What were their reactions after it was proven successful? And I would add to that, was it proven successful? Mm. Oh, I know. That's your, that's that's Chris's... Uh, okay. So, um, yes, there absolutely were field commanders who didn't believe in it. And probably at the end of the war, they still didn't believe in it. Um, you know, it's very hard to convince some people. Um, but this was a, a, a problem that when they did the postmortems on this after the war, they talked about it and talked about the the commanders who just couldn't kind of get it into their head that this was a good idea. They just wanted to be those, you know, I just want to, you know, charge the castle and charge the walls and couldn't get into this. Interestingly, there's one general in World War II in Europe, who is a totally on board with deception. He's a guy that the deception planners said, you know, he he was the easiest person for us to work with over there. He was always, you know, willing to do what was needed to be done uh, in the interest of the overall picture. And that general is George Patton. And so you might think, oh, Patton, he's all blood and guts and the, the ivory handled pistols and cussing and swearing, but he is embraces deception and it's probably no coincidence that the majority of the deceptions that they carried out in Europe end up being carried out for Patton's third army. I mean I was gonna ask you about that, yeah. I mean they are they are working for the twelfth US Army group. So technically they could be doing deceptions for the first army, right. the third army, the ninth army. Um, and they do a big Ninth Army deception at the end of the war. But they do a lot of deceptions for Patton. And I think the reason is is they, they found it easy to work with Patton. Did and you, they do deceptions for the Eighth Corps under Patton, so they probably also there was probably also a relationship with the Eighth Corps command. Did you ever come across anything from anybody in First Army saying, Hey, we got something going on up here, we could use your help, or is it just Not so far. Yeah, not not that I've seen. And then there could be there could be stuff out there. You know, I mean there's a lot of research that could still be done. Sure. But I want to address your addition to the question, which is uh, was it successful? It, also not an easy question. Right. Um, because how do you prove a negative? How do you prove that you know, if no if, if you're trying to prevent an attack and no attack takes place, did you prevent it? Or were the people who were going to attack really just off at the bar that night, having right. a drink and not planning to attack? I think there's a couple of deceptions that they did. Uh, one uh, at the end of the war, Operation Viersen along the Rhine River, their biggest deception. Um, another one, uh, Operation Bettenberg in September 1944, where they're holding a, a spot in uh, George Patton's line, uh, sort of a 25 mile gap that Patton has left in his line while he's attacking Metz. Uh, and another one, um, going backwards, but another one, uh, Operation Brittany in um, August 1944, where they're trying to make it seem like Patton is moving in one direction and he's really moving in the other direction. And I believe that those three certainly were successful and other ones might have been successful too. And part of it is, is how do you define success? Because you don't have to convince the enemy for very long for it to be success. And I, I use the football analogy that if you can, uh, with a head fake or something along the line in football, if you can get another player to, to get a half step advantage on him, mm -hmm. that can be all it takes. So maybe you're only fooling the enemy for half a day. You know, maybe you only have them confused about it, uh, not really fully convinced, but that might be enough to hold up their actions and therefore put you in a better position so let's kind of do a hypothetical i guess um because one of the things about this unit that you read about that comes out is just how complex these things were i mean this isn't a simple operation so how does a deception happen like how does how do the guys in the 23rd know okay We've got a mission. And then what do they do to make it happen? So I'll take a specific yeah. deception as an example. Um, um, one of the ones I know the most about, Operation Bettenberg in September 1944. Um, so they're, they're sitting around in, um, outside of Paris. 
and Eisenhower's headquarters is uh, at a hotel in Versailles. And the commander of the 23rd, uh, one day, I'm going to say September 15th, it's around that time, mm -hmm. he gets summoned to the offices of the Special Plans Branch of the 12th U.S. Army Group with Billy Harris and Ralph Ingersoll and probably some other people. And he is told that there's a gap in Patton's line and he needs to go fill it for a few days before they can get a real division in there. Mm -hmm. So he comes back and alerts his officers and in there in Saint-Germain-en-Laye, so that's not too far from Versailles. Mm -hmm. And they essentially, that's at noon, by 4 p.m., they're on the road. They have all their trucks, they have all their stuff. They're in a convoy, which takes two days to get to Luxembourg. And they arrive at Luxembourg um, along the front lines at about um, 10 o'clock at night. And that is, that they, you know, the, and the mission that has basically been handed down is you're pretending to be um, a combat command or two combat commands of the 6th Armored Division. And so they're probably already making plans as they are driving there, as they're getting ready to go. They arrive there at night. They immediately start. They've already started with radio deception as they're coming in with the radio trucks uh, mimicking the 6th Armored Division radio. Mm -hmm. When they arrive, they immediately launch uh, sonic deceptions to make it seem like tanks that are moving in. Just like a real uh, division or regiment, they've sent people in advance who've scouted locations for them to bivouac, set up a headquarters, set up tank parks, you know, whatever you would have to have. And they've studied all this for a, a division and so they kind of go into action and by um, uh, early uh, in the early hours of the morning overnight they're setting up the inflatables so they've already done the radio they've already done the sonic now they're doing the inflatables and uh, and then they're going to start doing other stuff you know going in and out of town traveling their trucks along the road they would put the bumper markings on their vehicles for the division that they're impersonating so in this case when they were impersonating the 90th uh, division, you're putting 90th Division markings on the vehicle, um, and that's how they get go. And in that case, they they are and they they tie their radio networks in with the real radio networks. They also do um, that's for fake messaging. They also tie in with wire uh, cable to to the real headquarters so that they can communicate. And then they're in ideally in a in, and they were in this case they're in pretty constant communication with the real army headquarters so they can coordinate with them. So um, one of the things that you, you touched on this, with, especially with the picture, that I found really interesting was um, this fourth type of deception. Because when they go, that's not part of their operation. They're not trained to do that. Right. Um, so, kinda, so it shows an evolution in the field of what they think they're going to need. Um, the other thing I thought was really interesting that we focus a lot on the inflatable tanks because, well, they're just really cool. <laughs> uh, but but as the war goes on, of course, we have air superiority. Uh, so that becomes less and less important because any German plane that appears over the front is going to get shot down and they're not going to see them anyway. Um, but you talk about this fourth type of deception. What is it and how does it come about and kind of where does it fit into the scheme of things? Right. And so it is really interesting and and. And I, I want to. I will talk about the fourth type of deception, but I'll say one sentence before that. That as the as the inflatable tanks, and this is just one from from Operation Breast in August. And I love how it. You see how it's camouflaged, and yet you can still see it. So it looks. It's pretty realistic looking inflatable tank. Right. Um, as the inflatable tanks become less important, um, uh, a couple of types of deception become more important. And one is the radio deception. And just to mention that that is a big part uh, of what they did. It's the least sexy thing. Sending out fake radio messages by Morse code is just not sexy. And it is probably one of their most effective forms of deception. Right. And so, you know, a shout out to, to the radio guys, the radio trucks, George Dramas, who's still alive, and the other radio operators. They did a great job. But everybody in the unit is involved in this fourth type of deception, which is called special effects. 
And the basic idea is this. Um, we, we've gone to war with these three types of deception. So we can fool the German observers from church towers or airplanes. We can fool the, the listening posts across the river. We can fool the guys on the radio. But what happens if the Germans have left some spies around as they've retreated to Germany? Who are watching and they I mean if they don't see tanks if they don't see soldiers if they don't see something going on those people will kind of hurt your message so they developed this idea of special effects which is we're gonna we're gonna put the bumper markings uh, sorry on our vehicles um, and drive them back and forth through town we're gonna create phony counterfeit shoulder patches and these are some of the actual counterfeit soldier uh, shoulder patches that they created from the scrapbook of Seymour Nussenbaum and we're gonna put them on our guys and our guys are gonna go into a cafe or go into the a water point you know where where you collect the water for your unit um, meet with the mayor of the town whatever wearing those shoulder patches we're gonna create phony headquarters because if a regiment is in an area, if the 119th regiment is in an area, you need to have a regimental headquarters. And so if you look at this picture, this is a fake headquarters. Um, and you, the, the things that make it look real, well, you have, a, you have an MP uh, to the right of the picture. You have a Jeep with 119th uh, uh, regimental markings, 30th Division, 119th uh, regiment. You have a, a sign over the doorway that says Crisis CP, so that's the... Um, 30th the, Division. Yeah, yeah, and that's, the, that's their, uh, code, their code name. And you have all those wires, which all those wires basically are nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they're just, they put them there. They're just wires. So you have um, this uh, phony command post so that anybody who sees any of this stuff is going to report back and say... Um, well, yeah, I saw trucks with the, the 30th Division markings. I saw 30th Division headquarters. I saw <clears throat> guys with 30th Division patches. And maybe they see it and maybe they don't, but you're making sure that you're not going to undermine your own message. And that's kind of the genius of special effects. And it's developed by the enlisted men and the junior officers. It's developed in the field not superimposed by the command, not something they brought across the ocean with them, but something that came out of their own experience. And again, a shout out to the to the Army and to the command elements of this unit, uh, Clifford Simonson, who was the operations uh, officer of this unit, that they listened to these ideas um, and were willing to do them. And you know, one of the parts of a fake headquarters, Chris, what, what does a fake headquarters require? Fake troops. And a fake commander. Oh, I love it. Yes, I was going to ask you. There's fake a great commander. story about that. Yeah. So, well, I got a bunch of them. But, I mean, this is the, if the, if, you know, you had guys pretending to be generals. You have guys pretending to be colonels. And in this particular fake headquarters here, which is in Dulken, Germany, and I just I just love this. So I'm just going to show this for a second. Um, we found the building. This is what it oh, looks great. like today. Uh, so I've been there. I haven't yet had a chance to go in and say, "Hey, did you guys know?" Anyway, because uh, it's a it's a bar. No, we know nothing. It's a bar. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you have so you have a fake headquarters. You need a, a colonel in this case, and the colonel in this fake headquarters was played by a captain named George Reb. And George is I don't know. He's tw he's a West Point grad, but he's probably 24, 25. I mean, he's very young, right? Yep. Uh, he's just out of West Point. Um, and he's wearing, um, uh, he's in there coming in and out from time to time, and he's impersonating a colonel. And a couple of other American officers um, uh, who happen to be West Point classmates of his uh, are in the area, and they're trying to like get directions or something, and they discover he's there, so they go in to say hello, and, and they're captains, and he's a colonel. <laughs> And what the what the what the hell's going on? And they don't want to ask him, but when they or they're walking out, and they say to his staff sergeant, "Well, what's the deal?" And and the sergeant goes, "Oh, sir, fortunes of war." You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but this happened all the time. And there was another impersonation where there was a guy impersonating a general, and same same. Um, I think it was the same operation. And they're they're on the road in a convoy of jeeps with this guy in General Stars, and they've got guards with Tommy guns and the whole thing. And 
um, the thing he was most afraid of was what happens if we run into another general. <laughs> It's my you know, division. How, no, it's my division. How, how far? <laughs> how far do you take it? Because they're not supposed to tell, right? right. They're not supposed. You don't want people to know that there's this uh, bizarre, fake unit around. But um, you know, you what happens when you run up against a reality there? Well, I was going to say, you know, actually brings up an interesting point because we love these stories and it's always fun when we trick the Germans. But it's a very tricky thing that they're doing. It's not only is to keep the secret, you know, operationally with the Germans, but also most most of the American army doesn't know about this, and um, that that causes problems. And I, I wanted you to kind of mention there's the the deception around Brest, right? Where again, this is all new. Um, they do too good of a job. So so what what happens if? Well, in, in Brest, and um, I don't think I, I didn't put the map in here, but in Brest, they, um, Brest is besieged. It's a port city. It's besieged by the Americans uh, who really desperately want the Germans to surrender so they can use the port um, or they want to beat them so they can use the port. And, um, but they kind of don't have enough troops. So one of the things they do is they bring in the, the ghost army and the ghost army impersonates... Um, uh, elements of the 6th Armored Division on the flanks with the idea of drawing uh, forces away from the center. That's sort of the basic idea. It's a little more complicated, but that's the basic idea. But there's somewhere along the line, there's a commander um, on some level who doesn't really believe in this deception. And so uh, he decides to uh, send out a unit of light tanks in exactly the spot where the ghost army has been kind of, you know, waving their red flag at the bull of the Germans saying, look, we're here, we have tanks, we have forces, we have stuff. And so the Germans have sighted their 88s on this area uh, and are watching carefully. And then when the real attack comes in that area, it gets clobbered. Um, and I have photos of, of the knocked out tanks because the guys, uh, you know, saw them later and uh, they got they got hammered. And so, um, and it was really um, upsetting to a lot of the soldiers. And I think in a way, it's, it's Brest is kind of where they started to take themselves seriously. You yeah. know that. I mean, they too, like everybody else, they too were sort of like, come on, is this, some of the guys were like, we're going overseas, is this really real? I mean, are we really going to set up inflatables right. and do this whole gig? And at Brest, they saw that they could attract attention and then that if the communication was bad, that doing your job too well could have a negative effect. Mm -hmm. Brest was the first operation where they did all of their types of deception together. It was the first um, um, operation, I think, where they really started to, to understand what they were all about. Um, we're working now uh, with the American Embassy and um, some of the towns in um, that area to put up a historical marker on the site of that deception because it really is the start of, of the Ghost Army's, you know, kind of most ability to be a successful deception unit. All right. I have a question here from uh, Cotton Smith. I'm going to try to get you to see. There we go. Uh, and we've had similar questions uh, to this one here. Uh, Cotton wants to know if you look at all of this from the German from Germany's perspective, they were obviously smart enough and organized enough to try to detect deception. What did they do to detect Allied deception? And did Germany have units similar to our Ghost Army? So uh, shout out to Cotton, who's uh, one of my college classmates. Um, the Germans to detect deception, they did what probably everybody did, which is you know try to look very carefully at the incoming material and uh, compare it to what you already know and see if it seems credible. So for example, with radio deception, the Germans were really, really good at uh, distinguishing individual American telegraphers by their sending style. So you have, when you send on the telegraph, you know, the Morse code, you have a style. You might not think you do, but you do. Um, that's, that's very distinguishable. Uh, it's the speed you send. It's where you make mistakes. It's where you kind of have pauses, etc. And so the Germans, if you're impersonating uh, 
I'm looking at, I'm, I'm speaking from the American point of view, but I'm trying to think about the German point of view. Uh, you hear you hear a radio message, and it's supposed to be from an operator in the sixth armored division. Does it sound like somebody else, you know, f you know, from the sixth armored who you've been listening to? So um, there's one of the reasons that these radio deceptions worked is because the ghost army guys were good enough, and and they worked to uh, practice to practice sounding like that person before they went on the air to learn their sending style to imitate it so that the Germans wouldn't um, catch on so the answer is that the Germans are trying to look very carefully at the details um, uh, to see if there's anything askew and the Americans are trying really hard to make sure the details are correct so that the Germans don't catch on now the Germans did some good deception work, especially before the uh, Battle of the Bulge. Yep. Um, they did not have a unit like this one. They did not have this sort of mobile multimedia tactical dedicated unit. To well, the, you were saying this is the first this time is, they're, they're a dedicated unit. To my knowledge, yeah. a very key phrase here, <laughs> this is the first time and maybe the only time I, I have not, and maybe, you know, the Chinese army has one or something, but, you know, the American army, even though they did this and it seemed pretty successful in World War II, they never created another one. They didn't create another, to my knowledge, dedicated deception unit that worked in uh, Vietnam or, or Korea. They did deception, uh, a lot of deception in the first Gulf War, but it was different units uh, seconded for that purpose. And today's PSYOPs troops... Um, deception is part of their mission, and of course they don't say exactly what they're doing to me. Or they'd have um, to kill you. Or they'd have to kill me, and and they could do it. I've I've met those guys, <laughs> very confident <laughs> in their abilities. Um, so so in a way you could say, well, the psyops troops are the closest we come now to a dedicated deception unit. But deception is 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 is, is hard. Go it's hard to keep it going in the army right, yeah, in yeah. peacetime because everybody wants to be in the infantry or the tanks and they want to advance. And, and the guys who are in deception are kind of off to the side. And even today. Um, the highest you can go in psychological operations, psyops, is colonel, full sure. colonel. So there is no general of psychological operations. So if you want to be a general, you're going to have to move over to civil affairs or move someplace else. Oh, yeah. And um, and that you know, so it's always going to be a little bit of a sidelight. Except you know, it's it's kind of like the um, uh, the Kipling poem. You know, it it's uh, uh, Johnny it, uh, Johnny this and Johnny that and that, Johnny go away. Yeah. But it's Hello, Mr. Atkins, when the band begins to play. So yeah. it's the same thing with deception. It's like, oh, the war started. Where are the deception guys? We could really <laughs> use that right now. Well, so one of the questions, um, uh, and and Catherine Hurst is, has asked, and and we were thinking along the same lines here. Um, but what is the most interesting thing you've learned since you wrote the book that you wish you could have included? Uh, uh, I would, and I would clarify that by saying, while you were doing the research, was there something you really wanted in there? That well, you just look, couldn't, couldn't get. What I've always wanted is more on the German perception, but the, the German point of view. Um, we've we've tried a little bit of effort to try to get that. It's not easy to find. You can't just interview old German soldiers and say, ask them if they saw any inflatable tanks. It's not quite that simple. So that's what I would have wanted to get in there. We have um, um, learned a bunch of things. I mean, I you know the I showed a picture of the fake patches, and the whole my a lot of my knowledge of the crew that made the fake patches and how they did it and the processes they used and how many they made all came after the, the book came out, and that came through Seymour Nussenbaum. And so that was a really fascinating uh, uh, thing. Um, I discovered uh, last year uh, a series of messages between Eisenhower and Marshall's headquarters about the priority for this unit. Kind of interesting stuff. Eisenhower, and it's not Eisenhower personally, but Eisenhower says... Um, I want this unit on this particular convoy in, um, you know, in May so that they're going to get here in time. And Marshall cables back the same afternoon, like, OK, we can do that, but we'll have to displace 1,000 combat pilots. And then Eisenhower goes, OK, yeah. you can, I'll take the combat pilots, but then they got to be in the next uh, convoy, which they were. 
And so it was kind of interesting to realize that there, the, the, the degree to which it was important. It wasn't worth a thousand combat pilots, so it wasn't that important. But it was, uh, it was still important enough that that uh, came through. And we've also been doing a lot of research, and in fact, Kathy Hurst uh, has been doing some of the research uh, into the lives of individual Ghost Army soldiers uh, after the war. And there's some really interesting stuff there, too. Um, I think that we, we knew there were a lot of artists in the unit, but there's more than we thought there were. Um, there were people who, there are also sort of dancers and uh, people being doctors, fashion designers, architects, um, they scientists. They had a dancing section? Um, they didn't, but there <laughs> were people who became dancers. Okay. And so uh, they had scientists. They had a lot of interesting people. So, so it's really interesting to learn more about the sort of the variety of people who were in the unit. And, and it's kind of amazing that a thousand guys, that, that they ended up doing all this uh, incredible stuff after the war that they did, but they had this incredible variety of people in the unit. Also, really interesting, it has absolutely nothing to do with the Ghost Army particularly, but probably 20 to 25 percent of these guys uh, had parents who were foreign born. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a different country 75 years ago. It's much closer to the immigrant experience right. than it is today for the m big part of the country. There were 22 guys in this unit who were born overseas, uh, who um, most of them in Europe. You know, they were from Russia and Romania and Germany and Italy and France and Britain. And so that's been interesting to learn. So, I mean, none of this is stuff that's at the heart of, like we didn't discover the, the deception that that never came off or we didn't discover that they saved, they really saved the war or something. No, but you're but finding out more about the unit. More about right. the unit. And like, as I said, I, I well, we were doing, um, uh, Kathy was doing research into uh, a veteran named George Dramas and we discovered that George Dramas was alive. <laughs> So hey, I George, called him up. up. <laughs> I called him up. Here's uh, here's how I'll do the research. I'll give him a call, <laughs> and uh, and he started telling us about some things. And one thing he told us about was he confirmed a story I'd heard from another veteran about uh, a shelling that hit the mess tent and injured a bunch of guys uh, during an operation. And I'd never. I'd always wondered if that story was really true because this veteran had told it, and I'd never heard anybody else tell that story. And then here's somebody you know, years later and a thousand miles away telling the same story. So that's always kind of cool to get that sort of confirmation. So um, we've gotten this question a couple different ways, but I'll ask it to you now. Were the guys in the unit, were they, it's part of the reason that it, it's not well known to your book was that they weren't allowed to talk about it. Were they allowed to talk about their war? So a lot of the guys were told not to talk about it. I'm going to say a lot and not all because some of the guys say they weren't told that. And right. um, it's very clear that everybody in the Sonic unit got pretty strict orders. It's very clear that all the officers had pretty strict orders. Um, it's less clear that every single person in the camouflage unit was told that. But there was a general, at least a, an understanding that uh, to keep it on the down low or keep any details of it on the down low. So a lot of the guys did not talk about it for 40, 50 years after the war. And uh, literally people got married and were married for 25 or 30 years and their wife passed away and the wife never knew about it. Um, I We recently... Uh, we've talked to, to pe families recently whose father died in the 80s or early 90s and never mentioned it. And they had no idea in one case until we contacted them. Uh, somebody, another veteran, didn't know he could talk about it until he saw the documentary on PBS. I guess that that's a clue. He trusted right? you? <laughs> <laughs> he trusted PBS. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so so a lot of them didn't talk about it. And there, and the, and it was classified until 1996. Um, and despite the classification, there were uh, the occasional article that mentioned it. The occasional person who talked to a newspaper through the years. We've we've tracked uh, maybe half dozen articles like that. Uh, but the army, I think, uh, managed to do a pretty good job of keeping it very, very quiet until they decided they didn't need to do that anymore, which probably came about simply because enough time had passed and tactics have changed and uh, the things that it would reveal are no longer that important. 
Well, one of the things, the another question I had um, that I find very interesting in the book is you talk about the unit coming home at the end of the war, uh, and they came home as a unit. That's kind of unusual. So a lot of units, you know, obviously my example is Easy Company, the guys ship home individually on points. But the Ghost Army gets shipped out of the ETO pretty quickly and as a unit. Um, have you come across any indication that they were going to be deployed to the Pacific? Or was there oh, yeah. a reason? So they were going to be deployed oh, yeah. to it. They brought them back in um, uh, June, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, brought them back. They burned all their inflatables in Europe because they were going to be issued with new ones. Uh, they brought them back, uh, stationed them at Pine Camp, um, told them that they were going to be part of the invasion of Japan, and gave them a month leave. And uh, toward the end of that month leave, uh, the atomic bomb fell. And so they came back knowing that they uh, were probably not going to have to go to, to uh, Japan. They were slated to be part of the invasion. Uh, shortly after the bomb fell, there was a message from Eisenhower's headquarters saying he no longer had need of their services. Um, so, and I think that everybody in that unit was happy that that bomb fell. Absolutely. I'm just gonna, you know, I'm not, I'm not commenting on it one way or the other, but I'm saying sure. that they all, they all, they did not, they had come through Europe with four people died, three, three killed in action, one uh, an accident, several dozen, you know, badly wounded um, um, and uh, lost to the unit. They did not think they were going to be that lucky if they were doing deception in the invasion of Japan. So they were pretty happy about the way things worked out. So um, question we have much further up the list, and I'm not going to try to scroll because I'll lose it. Um, very simple question, but early on somebody wanted to know if you could explain that really nifty pin you have on your, on your breast <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's kind of an interesting story, too, um, and I'll show and, it. And you can also let people know where they can get their very own. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that we could we can prefer. <laughs> provide them um this is a ghost army pin and it is um this design appears on the cover of the official history of the unit that's in the national archives um and then that cover has this design uh, uh on it uh surrounded by uh drawings of of the patches of every unit they impersonated and it's both divisional and core patches, and it's 36 patches in all. And so we don't know who who designed it. Um, there's been some discussion that it was Fred Fox, who we mentioned earlier, or that it was somebody else. Um, we're not sure, but it appears on their cover. People ask about the name, the Ghost Army. They say, well, did they call themselves that in the war? Absolutely, they did not. But does the name date from the war? Well, this is the insignia on the cover of the official history, which was written in November 1945. Um, and there's an article, because somebody talked, uh, and I mentioned that about secrecy, and there was an article that originally appeared in the Worcester Telegram in August 1945 uh, called, you know, Ghost Army, Fool's Enemy, and Neatest Trick of War or something. So the the idea of the ghost and the phrase ghost army date from the time of the war again not precisely sure of the origin of it okay um i have another question here from our good friend ted kind of one of those nice big uh end of questions here is uh ted wants to know are there any estimate on the number of allied casualties prevented by the efforts of the ghost army has anyone taken a stab at estimating such a hypothetical so there have been some some estimates um and i I think that they're 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 hard to to pin down, but the estimates that that we've heard uh, that have come out of some uh, you know army staff stuff is somewhere between fifteen and thirty thousand people, and and I I don't know I I don't know how you can know that you know and I think I think it's very possible that in the last deception alone that they may have felt that they saved thousands of lives because you have this big invasion across the Rhine that basically has almost no casualties yep. in the first day and they thought they might have thousands of casualties. I would say two things about the, the, that number. Um, 
you know, one of the soldiers in our in the unit said, um, you know, they say we save fifteen to thirty thousand lives. If it was only fifteen to thirty, it would be worth it, in the sense, of course, obviously that every life is important. This this unit is a, the idea of kind of using creativity uh, and illusion to fool the enemy and to save lives. And the fact that that it does uh, succeed in saving lives. Um, is is very important no matter what the number is. A few years ago I was at a screening of the film and a guy walked up to me at the end of the screening and he said I was a tanker under Patton uh, I was a tanker under Patton at Metz and I never heard of this unit but watching your film I think this unit might have saved my life. Now, you can never know, right, whose lives were saved or, or who they were, uh, how many who they were. But here was a guy who thought uh, that maybe uh, he wouldn't have been around if it hadn't have been for this unit. And he had, you know, he was showing me pictures of his children and his grandchildren, right. and that maybe they wouldn't have been around if it hadn't been for this unit. And that was a particularly emotional moment for me to understand that that there are you know, we don't know them, but there are names and faces that go with those lives saved. Yep. You know, yep. they may not be known only to God, but but they do exist. Yep. So, um, there's something about this story that has kind of latched onto you and doesn't let go of you. Um, and you continue to do research on them uh, and you continue to discover new things. Could you let folks know about some of the projects you're working on now? Um, there's one in particular I want you to talk about um, involving your elected representatives. So if you could let people know what you're up to and where they can find out more about the Ghost Army, and then I'll say some sage things here to wrap things up. Wow, that is something to look forward to. Um, yeah, so so the best website to, to find out about what we're doing is, is ghostarmy.org. And that's our nonprofit, the Ghost Army Legacy Project, which seeks to preserve and honor the unit. There's another website for selling the book and documentary, and you can, that's ghostarmy.com. You can go there too. But ghostarmy.org is is where we've tried to put, uh, and we try to put some of the information that we're finding out as as we go along. And we do have a big project right now. We are trying to uh, convince Congress to award this unit a Congressional Gold Medal. Um, and at this point where we are today, uh, we have more than 200 senators and representatives who have co-sponsored this legislation, but we need more in order to make it happen. And so we're asking anybody who's interested in helping with that to either check out on the website how you go about uh, doing that. And it's um, there's a page on the ghostarmy.org website you know, that says, how can I, you know, gold medal, how can I help? Or to email me, I am uh, rick at ghostarmy.org. And any other questions you have about it, you know, that's the email that they should go to. I should have put that in the, um, uh, yeah. in the uh, 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 type here, but it's not too hard. I think that's enough, enough letters that everybody can get it. Rick uh, at ghostarmy.org. And we're also doing ongoing research projects, and we're still collecting materials. Uh, many of the, much of our archive has now been donated to the National World War II Museum, but we're collecting more material that will go there. And we're just trying to make sure that these guys are not forgotten, because this idea uh, is a pretty cool one, and we want to make sure that uh, it's remembered. Thank you. Well, Rick, that was wonderful so anyway guys <laughs> um guys i just want we had so many questions that we didn't get a chance to get to um i'm sure rick as he gets an opportunity will probably try to shoot those folks an email if you have questions if you have the website please get in touch with him um i know i give rick a huge amount of grief about this but it is a wonderful book it's a wonderful documentary it's an important topic please please read them not for his benefit but your own <laughs> um, no but check them out they're they're very valuable um, and I just wanted to say that so, start again are you are you done I, no we're done we're done actually I hope you enjoyed that yeah we're done <laughs> or that, that, the old us are done the okay. new us are keep keep talking well you know just can't, can't get enough of myself can't, can't stop it uh, yes. next week 
Chris, yes. we will be talking about probably the best known and one of the most, most controversial, yes. and some say the most overrated <laughs> <laughs> American general in World War II, George Patton. Uh, and our guest will be uh, Kevin Hemel, who's our fellow uh, tour guide for Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, and who has just written Patton's War, an American General's Combat Leadership, Volume 1. Uh, question. Yes. Does the world need another patent book? Or? Well, that can be your first question. It's going Kevin. to be. When, <laughs> it's when going to be. Me. Kevin, if you're listening, uh, you know, you want to gear up for that one. So, um, But that's what we're doing next week. And thanks, everybody, for checking out that Ghost Army show this week. And we appreciate you all being here with us on History Happy. Very much. Stay safe, everyone. See you next week. 